here with Dan Gable here, the most winning coach in uh, college wrestling history. And you were a great college wrestler yourself, an Olympic wrestler. What made you focus on wrestling? Because I understand you were a multi-sport athlete when you were younger. Well, what, what happened was as you get older, you get to a certain grade, you know, like maybe high school. Once I got to 10th grade, I was pretty small. And so had I been bigger, I, I'm sure I would have played football and probably wrestled. Played baseball before that, swam when I was a kid, played even some Saturday morning basketball when I was in junior high a little bit. But, but mostly it was the one sport that I had the most success with. And it was going to be my sport from a standpoint of excellence as compared to the other ones. So, you know, the opportunity was given to me in a sport that, that uh, doesn't depend on your size as much because we kind of incorporate everybody and I happen to be one of the lighter weights. And because of that, I just started focusing on that. But I kept growing a little bit. And by the time I got to the Olympics, I was probably like in the middle weight class. But, but for me, uh, I was born into this community of Waterloo, Iowa that actually had some great wrestling going on. And so that gave me the opportunity to actually make sure I was a wrestler because everybody tried it here. And whereas a lot of places, they may not have that opportunity. And so I found out that that's, that was for me. And I also really liked the engulfment that you're totally engulfed in, 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 and you're not waiting for anything like a ball or a bat or, you know, you're just, you're, when you're going, it's up to you. You can go full speed, then you can sit down. But, but, uh, it, was, it just took me over. And you had a 64-0 high school record. What were some of the training techniques you used back in those days to stay in that kind of shape? Well, I was always the first guy to open the school up in the morning. I had a key. You can't do it now, obviously. There's more rules and regulations than you can shake a stick at. But, but I was the guy that lived right across the street. I opened up the gym, and, uh, and I went and I had a, got a workout in before school started. I usually did running and some lifting, some rope climbing, and, and actually maybe uh, some shadow wrestling, things like that. And then, of course, we had our regular practices during the season. And then the off season, I'd do a lot of uh, things that are very good for the sport besides actually wrestling, which I did quite a bit off season, but we didn't really have a lot of competitions then like they do now, you have the opportunities, but I did a lot of strength training, a lot of hard running, I don't, and, and I, don't, I didn't do any jogging except for warming up or cooling down. Okay. It was always the pace of a match uh, that was at a high rate of pace. So when I ran, I ran hard. Uh, when I ran steps, I ran hot, steps hard. When I um, wrestled and practiced, I didn't waste time. I got a lot accomplished. I executed a lot and got to the point where I could score a lot of points. And I learned about every position possible. In fact, I probably made a couple mistakes. I maybe have given my opponent too many things to work with in a practice room and end up getting hurt that way. So you've got to really be careful in a sport like wrestling that is very combative that you don't give your opponent too much because, you know, then you can get injured. And one thing you don't want to do is be, have an injury in a, in a combative sport. How important is cardio for amateur wrestling, would you say? Well, if you have a high pace of, if you wrestle at a high pace or, compete at a high pace, then it's really important. So if you don't, then it might not be as important. But if you run into somebody that has that high pace and forces you to go there, you better be ready. So it's very important. And you went 181 and one in college. Now you gotta remember that 181 and one, it happened 181 and then one. Oh, so, okay. And so that's my last match. So that's seven years without a loss. Which but is I, amazing. Well, what's amazing about it is that I got, I got tricked. My own mind tricked me into thinking I was gonna win. So I just kind of took the weekend off as far as uh, focus. I started signing autographs, doing interviews. You know, I can do an interview now. I mean, you know, no big deal. Now, if I was getting ready to coach or something like that, I wouldn't be shooting my mouth off. But I was, you know, probably promoting the sport one match too early, you know. Right. So, that, but it, it taught me a lot. Sometimes adversity teaches you a lot. Or it should, I should say it, it does teach you if you a analyze it, and I definitely broke it down because it hurt. And what did you do to get over it? Because I'm sure it must have really destroyed you for a well, while. Well, I, you know, I had some good support. That's the one thing. I had good family, good coaches, and I got right back into the wrestling room. I got right back into competition, started winning again right away, and then 
I had to go to a new higher level, and so I had to really kind of train smarter than just hard. You know, everybody can, anybody can work hard, but if you don't break it down and become really smart in what you do best and what you need to learn to do best, then you're kind of wasting time. So I, I really started becoming a lot smarter wrestler after I, I lost that match. And you won gold at the 1972 Olympics. What was your uh, biggest obstacle to overcome to win that goal, gold? Uh, I don't really think there was a whole lot of obstacles for me to overcome. I just had to perform. And I, I got hurt in February for the first time, missed, first time I ever missed a match in, in like uh, nine years in wrestling, which is pretty, pretty good because it, it is a, a kind of a, just a little bit, there's a little danger if, you don't, if you're not smart. And uh, so I, um, I think the biggest obstacle would, would have been uh, the guy better than me and beating me because I was ready to go. Yeah, and, and no he, one they came weren't. close. <laughs> yep. And you transitioned into coaching after that. Did you always kind of imagine yourself as a coach after your wrestling career? Well, I didn't really think I was going to change, get out of wrestling, but I really didn't know, and I didn't really thrive to be this great coach. But people around me kind of knew that, that I, that was for me, because every team that I was ever on coming through high school to college, even the world championships teams, were always very good teams. And a lot of the people were influenced by a guy like myself on the work ethic and the attitude and stuff like that. So I think some people really out there said, this guy's gonna be a good coach. He's affected and he's already created championship teams that he's been on. Other people have come through because they, he rubs off on them. And uh, so it was a natural. But I, but I didn't really understand that until I got later on, until all of a sudden a lot of accolades, and then you start thinking back, and like when you write a book or two, like I have now, you know, it kind of makes sense. It makes sense. And is there any particular reason why here in the United States you guys do folk style in high school and college rather than freestyle? Yeah, we do folk style because that's what we originally started doing. Uh, and we didn't really pick up with the Olympic style. So we really have developed that system or that way of scoring into a way of life. And to change over to that completely would actually maybe harm us right now, just because we're not like football or basketball or baseball. We can't really take that chance because we do have a good thing going. Now, you can add to it both, both ways. And if you really wanna be a good wrestler in scholastic wrestling even, you need to wrestle some freestyle in Greco because there's a lot of moves there and a lot of positions and a lot of different understandings. And you use it in the motivating in the off season. Now, whether we should have had that at the beginning or not, I don't know, it, but it, we don't. So we got to stick with what we have right now. And we have to work together to kind of come closer together. And I think we are. Both, both styles uh, of leaders have actually come together a little bit. And Pretty soon there'll be one wrestling. Now as the coach of the uh, Olympic team in the past and a successful collegiate coach, what do you think the most important principles are in a, in a good coach for amateur wrestling? I think a good coach keeps his team coming back every day hungry, uh, excited. Uh, you don't lose your players very often as far as quitting on you. Uh, that's not 100% true, but most of the time, eventually they'll come back and say, coach, I shouldn't have quit, <laughs> you know, that type of thing. So I think you really have to get to know your <clears throat> athletes, and I think you really have to keep them excited. So that means you, get, you have to know your sport. So that means you have to go to the higher level. So if you're at a scholastic or a, if you're at a collegiate level, you better understand the Olympic style, and you better be able to bring that into the room, keep people excited year-round. So I think it's more like um, you go to school to major in counseling, you go to school to major in nutrition, you go to school to major in uh, physics, you know, so those courses like that really are what your profession's all about. And as an amateur wrestler, what would be your best advice uh, to an up-and-coming amateur wrestler? Know that even though all the wrestling holes uh, you, you learn are really going to help your matches and be effective, and, and remember that there's, they're unlimited. As much, as much as you know, there's more. You just don't get it all. It's an infinity type of thing. But I really think that the most important aspect is what's inside your head. That mind, that brain. 
and how tough you think you are and just your, your disciplines that you master. And that comes inside your head, the mind. And if there's any doubts, you got to eliminate them. Because when you start having doubts against opponents or whoever, then that makes you more vulnerable. And uh, for me, when I got to wrestle, I just got to go out and compete hard because I kind of mastered everything. And that's the thing that you want to shoot for. It's, it's, it's difficult because there's a lot of disciplines that you do have to master to be a, a really good wrestler. How important is peaking at the time of an important tournament? Peaking is also very important. And you got to understand who peaks well in the world and who doesn't and who's always good. And I was talking about that earlier. Because USA, we always think it's, every match is important. Iran probably thinks every match is important. But the Russian teams and all the former, uh, you know, like Uzbekistan and, and uh, Belarus, Belarus and uh, Ukraine, those guys, they could care less sometimes whether they get a loss. I mean, they, you know, I shouldn't say care less, but it's, they know how to be ready. So you've got to remember that they may be more ready in a, in a higher crucial match. So that means, guess what? You got to be more ready as well. So you got to learn that peaking system. And that's about discipline too. And that's about being more ready to go than ever. And I know that, like, uh, there's a couple times when I went out and I wrestled a guy and I had beaten him earlier and I knew that he was going to be more prepared for this match. I wanted to show him right away that I was more prepared too for this match. And I heard you talking about it earlier, but how do you think the Olympic team of the United States is going to do in Rio this year? Well, we should do very good, and we hope that the Russians will be there, except if they deserve not to be there because they're all, you know, doping or something like that. But, but right now we have a very good team. Uh, we just need to um, peak right. And, and if we peak right, we'll do very good. Speaking of doping, uh, Brock Lesnar was recently... Uh, caught of failing a drug test uh, for his UFC fight. Just recently? The, the, the one last, he just won? Oh, you didn't hear about that? No. Yeah, he fa he, two no. of his uh, tests were flagged. Well, well, that's pretty disappointing to me considering he came through the wrestling route. And I'll tell you, um, you know what that tells me? His mind wasn't developed as well as it should. He took it for his mind to get stronger. I did not know. I just heard he won today. And now I oh, heard yeah. he, he got caught <laughs> doping. Well, that's a dope. Did you ever coach against him? Yeah, yeah, I, I, I've coached against him. Uh, you know, actually, I'm trying to think. Uh, maybe I just retired, so I was like thinking I was the coach yet. <laughs> you were but, maybe assistant or, or uh, watching. I'm not even sure. I think I might have just been on the sideline. But uh, he beat an Iowa guy in the national finals, and I was not the coach that, at that time. But I had coached that wrestler earlier in his career. Uh, and it was a tough match. Now, this museum that's named after you, of course, is affiliated with pro wrestling, which is kind of unusual because in Canada, for instance, amateur wrestling and pro wrestling do not mix. So what do you yeah. think of well, uh, the mix here? Yeah, we don't necessarily just totally mix. Uh, we have a wing here that's a pro wing, and you have to have been associated with amateur wrestling. And so that's the difference. It's, there's a lot of pro wrestlers that maybe came through other systems. And because they came through other system, they really don't have an amateur wrestling background. So we try to maintain that special part of this museum that you have had to become up through as a wrestler in um, amateur wrestling. Danny Hodge ended up becoming a great pro wrestler. Mm -hmm. Did you ever have the urge or the, an offer to become a pro wrestler? You know, they talked to me about something like that, but at that time, you know, coaching was a better opportunity for me. And because I'm of my side of, uh, you know, I wasn't a great big guy, you know, I don't know how big of a splash I'd make, but I, I see where they don't have to be such a big guy to, yeah. you know, and the women that are doing it. So, you know, but no, I, I, I never really second guessed coaching. Would I it, love coaching. Would it be possible to see a gay bull in the WWE in the future? Maybe someone... Well, I'll tell you, world. if you see a gay bull, it's because he's probably named after me. Or if it's a, if it's a relative, then uh, he better kick some butt. And this is the Dan Gable Teaching Center. Do you want to just tell our viewers a bit about uh, this facility here? Well, it's, this is not just a museum. Uh, it was a great idea. We got Kyle Klingman, who's over here right now. Uh, he, I don't know if it was his idea or not, but it probably was. 
but we have a wrestling room, which I think most, most people thought it was just going to be like, you can go in there and look at this wrestling room, but it's a hot commodity. And a lot of the local youth kids and cr clubs, and they come down here and they get, they go around and they get inspired by the museum and they come in here and they're inspired and they get to wrestle here and train in the, in the uh, Dan Gable Training Center. Now, what we're doing is that we realize that we're not quite up to date. The room's a little small because we, we get a lot of numbers in here. And we also have a lot to look at out there, but we don't have a lot to actually interact with. And so we've got to keep up with times. And so we were going to actually make this room bigger, which we're still going to do. And we were going to do some interaction out there, but we just had another museum, which the National Wrestling Hall of Fame is in Stillwater, just rebuilt down there. And they really have a lot of interactive stuff. They don't have a wrestling room. So we got that on them, even though they kind of uh, run the show. But uh, you know, we, we realized that we can do better even up here and want to make it uh, more of a uh, a grounds for all the sports, all the people of Waterloo, Iowa, or the state of Iowa, or Canada, whoever wants to come down here. And when they come in here, they'll actually have a great time and leave and be inspired. And I've heard Tom Cruise say that uh, you're one of his main heroes. Mm -hmm. What do you think of that? You know, Tom Cruise, I wish he would step up a little bit more for amateur wrestling just because, you know, he's such a busy guy and he's such, at such a high level. He did step up a lot for the religious thing, thing. I wish he would step up more for our sport because we could, we could use uh, a little help with a name like that. But, but no, I, I think he, uh, he enjoyed what he did when he was a wrestler and I think it helped him uh, get to where he was at today. And finally, do you have a website that uh, people mm -hmm. can visit you or social media? Where they right. I, my website is just called dangable.com. And uh, it, actually, you go there and you can see a lot of, uh, about me. But you can also, like, I do a lot of speak, speeches. And I do a lot of corporate speeches. But I do a lot of wrestling speeches, too. But I do a lot of that. So you can uh, look at that and see what you think. Or you can even uh, ask questions and stuff like that. I don't necessarily get to all of them. But... I have a person that looks at them and sees if uh, they're really important that uh, I'll get to them. Excellent. Well, thank you very much yeah, for talking you. to us. Yep.